A case that comes before Marshall late in 1801 will put him in direct opposition to his cousin and the new Republican majority. In 1800, William Marbury is a banker and a real estate speculator. The home he builds in Georgetown on the outskirts of the new federal capital is now the Ukrainian embassy. Marbury was a stout Federalist. In recognition of his loyalty, he was named a Justice of the Peace of the District of Columbia by outgoing President John Adams. Marbury was one of several midnight judges, so several judges who were appointed at the end of one administration before the beginning of the other. John Marshall, in his capacity as Secretary of State, is in charge of writing out commissions uh, to all of these gentlemen, and they're all, of course, gentlemen. And most of them had their commissions delivered sort of in an overnight rush before the handover of the reins of power from the Federalists to the Republicans. Marbury had been appointed. His commission had been sealed, guaranteeing the authenticity of the appointment. But the paper never got delivered. The commission never got delivered in the confusion at the end of the Adams administration. When Jefferson became president and Marbury requested the delivery of his commission, the executive branch said, nope, we're not gonna give it to you. Jefferson thought that having been made president, he should have the right to make these kinds of appointments. Jefferson coming in regards these, all these potential judges as potentially hostile. He saw this as an attempt to extend Federalist rule through the judiciary, uh, through any means necessary. And so he did see it as an attack on his power. Marbury tries for months to find out what happened to his commission, but everyone in the executive and in Congress, both firmly in Republican Party hands, stonewalls him. Finally, he goes to the Supreme Court, asking it to issue a writ of mandamus to James Madison, Jefferson's Secretary of State. And what a mandamus is, is an order from the court ordering somebody, a government official, to do something that the government official has a legal obligation, an obligation under statute or under the Constitution to do. And the Supreme Court, of course, was presided over by the new Chief Justice, uh, John Marshall, who, by the way, was Secretary of the State, acting Secretary of the State, who didn't deliver the commissions. So the case was, uh, you might say, loaded politically from the beginning. It was a, another example of this ongoing warfare between two cousins, uh, John Marshall and Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson's new Judiciary Act cuts Supreme Court sessions to one a year, so it's almost two years before Marshall hears Marbury's case. Madison refuses to appear and sends no lawyer to represent him. He and the president won't dignify Marbury's suit by their participation. Why did he take it? He took it because he saw that the Jeffersonians were about to undermine the Federalist vision of the Constitution and the country. And if there was going to be a fight about it, he was going to be on the front lines. And if Jefferson was on the other side, so much the better. I mean, they hated each other, and he was going to defend the, the, the court and the Constitution against the Jeffersonian uh, uh, revolution. Marbury versus Madison is one of the most clever uh, decisions in Anglo-American jurisprudence. It was an exercise of separation of powers at a very critical moment in American constitutional history. The relationship of the three branches of government simply had not been defined up to that point. It was a work in progress. I guess we need to explain what the case was. Did Marbury have a right to this commission? Is there a remedy for this right? Six justices, all Federalists, including Marshall, will decide the case. With Justice Chase immobilized by gout, the court conducts its business in a Washington boarding house where the justices live together while the court is in session. The peculiar delicacy of this case requires a full explanation of the principles on which the opinion is founded. When a commission is signed by the president, the appointment is made. To withhold William Marbury's commission, therefore, is an act that violates a vested legal right for which the laws of his country afford him a remedy. But then we get the rub. Then we get the third Marshallian question. <laughs> Does this court have 
the authority to right the wrong. Marshall doesn't want to go there because Marshall doesn't actually want to decide the case. And the reason he doesn't want to decide the case is because he's pretty sure that if he sends a writ of mandamus to James Madison, Madison will ignore it under Jefferson's orders. His court is quite weak at the time. Jefferson is quite strong at the time. Jefferson controls not just the presidency, but basically the Congress as well. Marshall wants to avoid a crash between the court and the president because Marshall knows he's going to lose. He ends up giving a disquisition on the law that cast Jefferson as a lawbreaker, as someone who'd taken away something uh, that Marbury was entitled to. But then he pivots from that to a discussion of the court's jurisdiction. Okay, so Article Three of the Constitution, which sets out the powers of the Supreme Court, says that in a certain class of cases, the Supreme Court can have original jurisdiction, which means the case begins in the Supreme Court. That's what Marbury is trying to do. Marbury has brought his case under a 1789 Act of Congress allowing the Supreme Court to issue mandamus writs to anyone holding federal office. But the Constitution only gives it original jurisdiction in a very limited class of cases that doesn't apply here. And when the Constitution and a law disagree, says John Marshall, the Constitution is paramount. While ostensibly declining to exercise power he hasn't been granted, exercising judicial modesty and restraint, he's actually asserting a grander, much more decisive and important power. It is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. The Constitution is a, a superior, paramount law, unchangeable by ordinary means, and no ordinary act of Congress may govern any case to which they both apply. Consequently, an act of the legislature repugnant to the Constitution is void. The rule requiring the Secretary of State to show cause is therefore discharged. The case is known for and is most properly famous for its recognition that the Supreme Court can hold an act of Congress unconstitutional. It's the one that is fought to establish judicial review. It is important because of the way that he did it by coming out in a particular way which goes against what you would think he would be for. Here he's refusing to do something in the interest of his own political party, the Federalist Party. Marbury does not get his writ saying technically the uh, administration wins. Jefferson is outraged by the decision, but there's not a lot he can do about it. The Jeffersonians hate this, uh, this case, this ruling, because they fear above all else this power in the hands of judges who are overwhelmingly, virtually exclusively, Federalists. This will be the power by which they rule from the bench. And that's what makes it so beautiful. I mean, Marbury loses, so it's not beautiful for Marbury. And the fact is nobody cares whether William Marbury gets a commission. But the legacy of the case endures, which is the power of judicial review. Now, this is this brilliant move, which we're going to see time and again in Marshall's career, of political statecraft. It's the way Marshall avoided a conflict with the president that he was bound to lose, the way he asserted judicial review and reaffirmed the difference between the executive branch, which is political, and the court, Supreme Court, which is legal. The case that Marshall chooses to announce the authority of judicial review is actually a case where Congress is trying to enlarge the power of the court. Right? Smart? Crazy? A little bit of both? Why do you think he did that? It's a decision that echoes down through time. At the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Professor Larson takes her students to a local tavern to discuss cases just as George Wythe did with Marshall and fellow students back in the 1770s. It's like a natural byproduct of, of creating the Constitution itself. I think that is exactly what Marshall would say, that it's just, it's inevitable, it's part of the function of constitutionalism. 
is to have a neutral arbiter. And Marbury versus Madison is often the focus of discussion. Because it was the case that cemented or announced the power of courts to strike down laws that are repugnant to the Constitution. And that is not an inevitable or necessary part of a democracy. There's plenty of other democracies out there, like England, where their courts do not have the power of judicial review. So I think it's useful for us to think about why did Marshall think it was so important for judges to have this power in our democracy? What makes us unique or what makes his reason so powerful? I would have to say that judicial review, the power of unelected judges to review the constitutionality of laws enacted by the elected representatives of the people, and if necessary, hold that they are unconstitutional and therefore unenforceable, is the greatest American contribution to jurisprudence.